Good morning. Welcome to Grove Park. We're so glad that you chose to worship with us this morning. If you're visiting for the first time, we would ask that you would fill out a visitor card located on the pew rack in front of you and place it in our offering plates located in the rear of our sanctuary. In way of announcements this morning, it is a busy day at Grove Park. It is a busy week at Grove Park. If you're on a committee, please take note of if you're meeting this week, uh, the personnel committee will meet at 4 o'clock this afternoon in the conference room next to the prayer room. The deacons will meet tonight at 6 o'clock in the Sunday school office. So please take note of that. Uh, Tuesday is election day, and so uh, if you have a muni if you live in a municipality, uh, be sure to go vote. I recognize this could get me in trouble, but I'm going to tell you what we say down east: vote early, vote often. Uh, so, uh, SIA planning uh, committee is meeting at one o'clock on Thursday. And on Friday, not in your bulletin, but if you were on the Williams feeding team, you need to see Janice Bird. Uh, you will have a meal this week to take care of, so please make note of that. Next Sunday is a good large Sunday in our church in which it will be full of celebration. We will be celebrating um, a baby dedication and we will be celebrating a baptism so I do hope that you will be here and make plans for that also that evening we have church conference and if you or your committee has a report uh, to bring please let us know in the office as soon as possible it is a bright glorious morning outside and we have been refreshed by cool air this week and the temperatures have moderated and will moderate as the week goes on as we enjoy the fullness of God's creation we look upon the flowers this morning that are on our altar given to God and in memory of Pat Owen by George Eddie and the rest of the family and we celebrate God's great gift of creation and we thank him that through his creation we can still see the handiwork of his hands and we can still hear the sweet consolation of his spirit. We are so glad that you are here this morning. Welcome home. You pray with me. Father, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians that no eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no human mind has conceived the things that God has prepared for those who love him. As we come to this time of worship, Lord, we pray that you would meet us here. Lord, we know that there is much trouble and anxiety in our world, in our community, in our homes. But we also know, Lord, that you have plans for each of us, just as Paul wrote, and that those plans are beyond our comprehension. So, Lord, meet us here. Help us to open our hearts and our ears and our minds. Help us to worship you this morning, Lord, and help us to hear what you have to tell us. And then, Lord, help us to take that out into the world that needs you so, so badly. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. C.S. Lewis is one of my favorite theologians. And one of my favorite thoughts of his, I'll paraphrase this morning, basically what he's saying is that God loves us so immensely that he's willing to accept us as we are. But God loves us so immensely that he's unwilling to let us stay that way. He's always working with us to, to move us into his image. And this morning as we sing the song, Speak, O Lord, as I was reading through the lyrics a while ago, it really struck me 
in a way that it hasn't before about how as we encounter with God that God is always seeking to change us to make us more like him teach us Lord full obedience holy reverence true humility speak O Lord and renew our minds help us grasp the heights of your plans for us as we sing the song this morning speak O Lord really think about what it is that God is saying to you as you are encountering God today through worship what is God wanting to change within you we may not like change sometimes some of us anyway but when God is working to change us he is always changing us for the better he's always changing us to make us more like him so indeed let's join with this song and say speak O Lord to us and make us more like you let's stand and sing together
Would the children come on down for the children's sermon? <laughs> hey, Chloe. Hey, guys, how are you? <laughs> uh, is it giving you trouble? Yeah. So let me ask you a question. When your team loses a game, what do you look like? That was that was actually a pretty good look there, Lance. Can you show it to us again? No? What do you think? When your soccer team loses, what do you look like? Um, it's okay. Um, be, um, because um, um, they can try again. You're exactly right, Chloe. It's okay because they can try again. But when Pastor Mark's Tar Heels lose... That is not really what he says. He says things like fire the whole staff, tear down the stadium, build a library. We don't deserve to play football ever again. So this week, my Sunday school lesson was about living victoriously because God has already gotten us the victory. Do we act like God has gotten us the victory that we have just won because when Pastor Mark's team wins, he jumps up and down. I know that might be hard to believe, but he does. And he hugs me and he high fives people that he doesn't even know. And he kisses me and he run. I've even seen him run back and forth. I mean, he is so happy. What if we lived like that the whole time? That we know that, that Jesus. Um, that would be worse. That would be worse. <laughs> well, I think it would be great if we acted like we had the victory all the time, rather than walking around with a sour look on our face, looking like our team had just lost, saying, fire them all. I think it would be better to have a smile and to think, man, God can do anything, anything. Don't you? Yeah, let's pray and thank God for the victory. Heavenly Father, thank you that you give us the victory through your Son, Lord. Help us to live as victors and not as the defeated. For we ask all things in thy Son's name. Amen. All right, you guys can head back to Children's Church. She had that pause right there where she said, and Mark kisses, and I was like, she done said I've high-fived other people. I hope she says me fast. <laughs> so uh, she, she pulled it out, though. So um, now it's left me. Um, it is November. I know. Where did the year go? And, and, and here's the thing. November's half over. And you say, no, it's not, Mark. Yeah, it is. Yeah, it is. I'm going to tell you how it is right now. Two weeks from today is the 19th of November. And on the 19th of November, we're going to have our alternative Christmas market. And the next day, we're going to pack Operation Big Thing boxes. And the next day, we're going to give it away. And the next day, we're going to have Thanksgiving service. And the next day, it'll be Thanksgiving. Now, see how, how November's already over? All right. So, <clears throat> if you um, uh, have not participated yet in Operation Big Thing, you see the needs that we have. We'll be sending out count totals probably this week about where we stand with various things. Uh, if you want to sign up to help pack boxes, which will be on the afternoon of the 20th of November, uh, if you would call Vicki and say, hey, I want to help pack, uh, we'll get you on that list. Uh, we hope to have the Christmas market out next week. If not uh, in, on um, paper, then definitely within the next week uh, where you can access it on the web begin thinking about that and being here that evening for that and let me go ahead and say you can be at work next Sunday too beloved because we're having a baptism and so you can bring somebody that you've been trying to reach to enjoy I say enjoy to experience what baptism looks like and you can use that to have conversation with them so 
uh, I would remind you that Ruth is here because Naomi invited her to come see her baptism, and Ruth's going to be baptized next Sunday. See how that works? Okay, so there's your marching orders. It's going to be busy, and pretty soon we're all going to have sleigh bells on. So go be the church at work. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you are intimately acquainted with all of our ways. Thank you that you love us so much that you're willing to take us where we are and move us closer to you. Thank you, Lord, that you've promised us victory over all things. Lord, sometimes when we look at the world, it seems like we're losing, but Lord, we know that you are in control and that you are moving to bring everything to the conclusion that you've already drawn up for the world. Father, we thank you that you've given us a big job to do. Lord, indeed, if all you ever called us to do were little things, then you wouldn't get glory with that. If all we ever did were little things, then Lord, we'd be willing to take the credit for ourselves. Lord, thank you for giving us big things to do, for giving us jobs to do that are bigger than we can do on our own. Lord, because that's when we learn to depend on you, and that's when we give you glory. So, Lord, do things among us that we can't do ourselves. Call us, Lord, to tasks that are bigger than us, so that you will receive glory. And Lord, help us always to be careful to give you the glory that you deserve. Father, again, as we look out in the world, we see big needs. Lord, we're aware of people who are grieving. We're aware of the hungry. We're aware of people who live in, in places that are so seriously flooded that all they can eat are water lilies because that's the only food that's available and because they don't have the resources to move anywhere else. God, we ask that you bless and help. God, we ask that you move in this big world to meet big needs in ways that will bring big glory to you. Show us what to do, Lord, and help us to do it well. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.
I invite you to take your copy of God's Word and turn to Micah chapter number 3. The liturgical year is drawing to a close. Advent is on the horizon. And so the lectionary begins a turn to look at the minor prophets. And truth of the matter is, we don't spend a lot of time in these guys. They deal with subjects we can't really understand. They speak in language that is difficult for us. And we treat them sort of like Kansas. We fly over it. Going somewhere else. Generally to Matthew. So for the next three weeks, we're going to take a side excursion to the flyovers. This week, we begin with the prophet Micah. Would you pray with me? Speak, O Lord. Speak, O Lord, with such clarity and such power that we hear your message today. We hear it in such a way that we know that you are speaking to us to empower us to go and speak your message in very dark places. Give us ears to hear and responsive hearts. And bless me, O Lord, with the words that are necessary for those who have gathered to hear from you today as we make our prayer in Jesus name Amen really we all know a lot about Micah for most of us we know that Micah is going to be the one that's going to uh, tell us that Jesus is going to be born in Bethlehem we know Micah chapter 6 because it's that great verse that says he has shown you Oh man, what is good and what does the Lord require of you but to do justly, to love mercy, and to walk humbly with your God. But beyond that, we don't spend a lot of time here. Micah is a contemporary of the prophet Isaiah. Micah lives and works approximately 25 miles outside of Jerusalem. And though he is outside of the... Um, capital and outside of the normal hub and flow of capital life, Micah is keenly aware, as the text tells us, about what is going on in Jerusalem and in the southern kingdom. And Micah's message is one that speaks to political, economic, and religious injustices that are being perpetrated throughout the southern kingdom. Micah is a fiery prophet. In fact, he is known as the um, southern kingdom's version of Amos, who we will look at next week. He's also regarded by some scholars as the conscience of Judah. And you know, when we hear that phrase, conscience of Judah, we may think to ourselves that as Believers in Jesus Christ, we are the conscience of the nation. That we are continuously calling the nation back to whatever it is that we think God would have the nation to hear. But as Micah explicitly 
tells us this morning we need to be careful when we call ourselves the conscience of the nation. Be careful to make sure that the message that we offer is our message, excuse me, is God's message and not our message. Verse number three says, excuse me, verse number five says this in chapter three. Thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who lead my people astray, who cry peace when they have something to eat, but declare war against him who puts nothing into their mouths. Therefore it shall be night to you without vision and darkness to you without divination. The sun shall go down on the prophets and the day shall be black over them. The seers shall be disgraced and the diviners put to shame. They shall all cover their lips, for there is no answer from God. The prophets of Isaiah's day, not, uh, excuse me, of Micah's day, are telling the people what they want to hear. If you give them what they want, if you give them money, if you give them food, they're going to say peace to you, but they're going to unleash on you if you do nothing for them. Their message is continuously pointed toward them and what they can get out of it. And so they point far and wide and bring uh, what they can get for themselves and ignore what it is that God is trying to say. And you say, we don't do that. Yes, we do. Yes, we do, beloved. We turn our message ever how we want to, to get what we want. We turn our message in ways that we might not even think is for our profit, but uh, is. You know, across the America, there are homeless shelters that will require a person to sit through a sermon before they are fed. And you say, well, Mark, they're getting free food. Guess what, beloved? The gospel is free. The gospel doesn't have strings attached to it. And we shouldn't ever make the gospel have strings attached to it. We should always be freely proclaiming it and freely saying this is what God says. Not what I say, but what God says. But how often is it, beloved, that we like to match the moment with the message? Not to our disbenefit, but to our benefit. Micah clearly doesn't care that he calls people out. Micah doesn't care that he is saying, prophets, you should be saying one thing and you're saying the other. He doesn't care that he's making people mad. Now, I know some of you are like, yeah. Like, you look forward to making people mad. And if they don't like it, they can lump it. It's in the book. But beloved, when you give that message, are you just doing it to make people mad or are you doing it to change them? Micah's doing it to change them. Micah sees where it's going and why is that? Because Micah sees that if this continues, there will come a day when God will be silent. That's what those, those, the sixth and the, and the seventh verse is all about. There's, if you persist in this, there will come a day when there will be no answer from God. There will be no revelation. In other words, God will not speak. Can you say, Mark, that can't happen. Yeah, it can. Yeah, it can. There can come a day where God will not speak into your life, beloved. You could read the book from cover to cover and not get a blessed thing out of it. And you say, nah, yeah. And when we persist in giving a message 
that is ours or persist in focusing on what we want to focus on instead of focusing on what God would have us focus on. Then there just comes a point where God says, I, I, I'm not working through this vessel. Let me move on. Next week, we won't look at this text in Amos, but in the book of Amos, God will say to the northern kingdom, there will come a day when there will be a drought and famine on the land. And it will not be a, a famine for bread, but it will be a famine for the word of God. And will that happen? Yes, because the northern kingdom will be destroyed. God will have had enough. And the northern kingdom and the ten tribes of the northern kingdom will be forever lost to history. We run the risk today, beloved, of that point in the life of the church. Well, how do we solve that? Well, the simple answer is, beloved, that we cannot be indifferent to the injustices that are present in the world. Look at verse number 8. But as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Hear this, you heads of the house of Jacob and rulers of the house of Israel, who detest justice and make crooked all that is straight, who build Zion with blood and Jerusalem with iniquity. Its heads give judgment for a bribe, its priests teach for a price, its prophets practice divination for money. Micah says you cannot put the finger on the scales of justice and have them tipped to you. You have to go forward and declare what is necessary in the world that God's justice would be pronounced. You cannot ignore trying to make crooked paths straight by what you say. But you must go and speak to those issues outside and address them. Now some of you would say, oh goody, because you have a, an issue that you, you really do think a lot about and you want to pound on that issue. But beloved, do you recognize the other issues around you this morning? The issues that are serious and are necessary for what is going on in the world. Do you recognize that in a materialistic society like we live in, the rampant greed that is present and the gross inequalities that occur because of that greed in our society? You say, well, greed's not all that bad. Well, beloved, if you go over to the book of Ezekiel, you'll find Ezekiel hear from God that the reason why God destroyed Sodom was because of their pride and their greed. Beloved, we cannot make greed a virtue when clearly God speaks of it as a vice. Well, what else? Well, beloved, where do you want me to shoot with this buckshot this morning? Because there are injustice rampant in the world. It was unjust, beloved. It was unjust that the students of Alamance County had to go uh, three weeks without going to school this year because we didn't tend to the schools the way we ought to. And you say, Mark, now you're being political. No, I'm trying to talk about justice. I'm trying to talk about the fact that we have turned our prison system in this country to a mental health hospital instead of dealing head on with the crisis that exists in mental health across this nation and the gross needs that we have for mental health that we are not addressing. I'm talking about the fact that we believe that we can medicate our way out of all the pain in the world and somehow or another in doing so we have created a nation of addicts. I'm talking about the fact that there is a severe housing crisis in our county 
and that if we knew some of the ways in which people lived in this county, we would rise up and say, no more. You say, Mark, these are all just issues of policy. Beloved, do you not think that these are not issues that are on the mind of God? Because don't you think that there is some mother whose child cannot get adequate mental health care that they need and is praying to God for an answer and that this petition is being bombarded upon the heart of God and no one is answering it? Don't you think that there are parents out there who are trying to figure out how to feed, how to educate, how to clothe their child and find housing for them at the same time? Don't you think that there are parents out there whose children are incarcerated and the plight in which they find their incarceration is daily being brought to the mind of God because it is daily on the heart of the parent? Beloved, these are crises. These are the sort of crises that Micah is addressing here and which all the prophets seek to address and which we cannot be silent about. And you say, well, Mark... I'm just one person. What do you expect me to do? This is hard. Dale already stole my thunder. I'm sitting there listening to him pray, and I thought, he's read the rework of the sermon. Because there once was a time in our nation, beloved, when our president declared that we go to the moon not because it is easy, but because it is hard. And throughout the tenor of our nation, we have done things because it is not easy, but because it is hard. And Micah is not alone in what he is doing, and neither are you. How do I know that? Beloved, you need... Frank Orr was my history teacher. He was my world history teacher at Richlands. And any time there was a, a particular date in our... Uh, chronology that we were learning that we had to remember. Frank would say this. By the way, Frank was so old, he taught my dad and both his brothers. Frank would say 1066. Now some of you don't know 1066, but 1066 was the last time England was successfully invaded by the Normans. And Frank would say, write it down, 1066. Star it circle it, underline it, have arrows pointing to it, and stars shooting out of it. Beloved, take your pen and go to Micah chapter 3, verse 8, and do the same thing. For when you think that you are alone, when you're trying to deal with the injustices in this world, understand that that is a complete and total lie. It is a lie that has been sent to you to keep you silent and on the sidelines of the arguments that are going to make people's lives better and declare the glory of God in this land. Because what is it that Micah says? Micah says, but as for me, but as for me, I am filled with power, with the Spirit of the Lord, and with justice and might to declare to Jacob his transgression and to Israel his sin. Micah says, I've got power. And where does that power come from? The Spirit of the Lord. Now, beloved, I told you you weren't alone, right? I told you, you weren't alone in whatever it is that you're seeking to address. Because guess what? You've got God. If you are a child of God, the Holy Spirit of God, at the moment that you came to faith, entered into your life, and has given you all of the power, all of the abilities to go and do and stand, you might think by yourself, but you can stand with the whole host of heaven behind you, lifting you up and pushing you forward so that you can say, I am filled with justice or righteousness is the other way you can translate this, but I am filled with what God says is right. And I am filled with might. So you can come on at me. Bring me the best that you got. But guess what? You can shoot at me all day long, but you better watch out for the boys behind me. Now, beloved... I know you got an extra hour of sleep. 
So you ought to be well rested. And that should get you excited. That should get you to say, you know what? I can do this. I can do this. You're not alone. You're not. You've just got to make sure that your message aligns up with God's message and that you go out there and declare that message in the full power, in the full strength, and the full might of what God has called you to. Now, are you going to be silent? Are you going to be silent today? Mark, I, can't, I just can't do it. Yeah, you can. Yes, you can. Mark, I'm too old. Beloved, with God with you until you're dead, you're not too old. Mark, I've only got so much capability. That's okay. Use what you got. My grandmother toward the end of her life was on a wheelchair was on a walker but she persisted in deciding to wash dishes every day and she was a vociferous dishwasher you could not leave a spoon on the table if you were going to stir your coffee later you better put it in your back pocket because she was going to grab that spoon and she's going to wash it Weren't much my grandmother could do. She couldn't even drive at that point. She'd take that wheelchair up to that sink, and Lord help me, she wore the ear of God off. Liza's grandmother, not in that bad a shape, but still, that woman was a praying woman. And it got so bad that we knew if there was a big event in the life of our church, the next day we better be up by 8 o'clock because Helen was going to call at 8 o'clock and ask how Bible school went. Why? Not to be nosy, not to be a good grandma, but the fact that Helen had wore out heaven. Pray it. You say, I can only do so much. Can you talk to God? Can you write an email? Can you pick up the phone and call somebody? Beloved, there is nothing you can't do with God's power at work in you. And you cannot shirk your responsibility to what it is that God is calling his church to do at this moment in the life of the church and in the life of the nation. Because if we persist in silence, if we persist in willful ignorance to not learn what is going on in the world, to not learn of the injustices that are being perpetrated every day, not just far abroad but right here, right here in our county, in our city, in our state. If we don't go and do that, there will come a day when it will mean our destruction. Pick up at the end of verse number 11. Yet they lean on the Lord and say, Is not the Lord in the midst of us? No disaster shall come upon us. Therefore, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins and the mountain of the house a wooded height. God says very clearly here, you can't get off with the excuse that I'm with you always. The church does this. The church quotes Jesus. And normally I wouldn't say quoting Jesus is a bad thing. But in this particular instance, it lulls us to sleep. Because we'll say, 
Upon this rock I have built my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And somehow, in our minds, we have equated that to God will never abandon the church. And he won't, beloved. There will always be a remnant of God's church. But it does mean, it does mean that there will, if you don't go and do what God's message is, there will come a time where the church is not what it is. And God's people will not have the voice that they have. And ultimately, things will grow dark. Beloved, did you hear this text this morning? God says clearly, He will destroy Jerusalem. If they don't get the message that Micah is sending, he says that he will destroy Jerusalem. Jerusalem shall become a heap of ruins. You say, yeah, guess what? It happened. It happened. There's going to come a, a force out of Babylon and it's going to destroy Jerusalem. Not one stone will be left atop another. The temple that they think is, when they say, is not the Lord in the midst of us, they're talking about the temple. It will be destroyed. The walls will be torn down. Boy, beloved, we have whole books of the Bible that talk about the rebuilding effort because the destruction came. So if God would do that, to Jerusalem, to his eternal city, which he tells us to pray for in the scriptures. If God would do that to his chosen people, to send them into exile, beloved, what do you think God would do with us? What do you think God would do with the church today? But don't just stop there. Think about the country. You know, we talk a lot about the fact that America is this very exceptional country, and I'm not disagreeing with that at all. But, beloved, if our exceptionalism doesn't mean that we become a force for good, are we really all that exceptional if we're just feeding our own selves? And not simply that, beloved. Not simply that. There are a lot of prognosticators. There are a lot of prognosticators who would say that our country is on the decline and they would point to lots of different places. I'm going to tell you what I believe Micah would say to us today. If our country declines, it's not on all these things outside that you want to point at. Not just me. All of us. The fact that we're inside these walls. The, 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 the plight will grow from inside these walls. It will not be outside coming in, beloved. It will be our silence, our inability, our blindness, our wanton disregard for the message of God that will go forth. If we can't be changed by it, why do we not think, uh, why do we think other people outside who don't know God will be changed by it? We will be the blame. Mark, I don't like that. Guess what? I didn't like to say it either. But sometimes, beloved, we have to hear the hard truth. Micah delivered the hard truth. I try to be like Micah. I don't always do it. Oh, I promise you, beloved, I'd rather preach on grace and love. And all those things are there. That's why we got the sign out front. You are beloved today, tomorrow, forever. But sometimes we got to have a heart-to-heart. -heart. 
And we can't say that the message of God at that point should be marked return to sender. Return to sender. I don't want it. I don't want to hear it. Send it back. We should say, okay, God, what is it you want me to do? Not return to sender, but where are you sending me? Here I am. Send me where you need me. Show me the plight of someone who needs to know grace and needs to be brought light and who needs someone to go speak for them. Show me what is hard and not as easy so that in going and doing the hard, I may show the eternal glory of the sovereign creator of the universe who continually worked and made and said, it is good. So that by the work of what I do through your power, Lord, when I come to the end of my toilsome journey, you may say, it is good to me. Let's pray. Well, Lord, that wasn't easy. But we cannot be quiet when you are calling us. We cannot turn deaf ears to when you call us into the dark places to bring light. When you call us into places that are completely void of food to bring food both spiritual and physical to bring water both to quench the physical thirst and to be life-giving water Lord we know that we are like Micah that your power rests within us and so Lord whatever it is that we are not going to do through your power today I pray that you would stir us now to respond that our call our answer to your call would be yes yes Lord yes for we ask this in Jesus name Amen beloved where has God spoken to you today I pray you would answer I pray you would heed his call you say mark i need a little bit of prayer for this we all do beloved we all do i'll be in the back i'd like to pray with you, you can come pray up here by yourself you can pray where you're sitting maybe the message that you have heard today though is the fact that god loves you enough that he has spoke a message about you and that message of that to you is that he wants a relationship with you I'd love to show you that path. Maybe, maybe what it is that God has spoken to you today is He's calling you to be part of a people who seek to be Micah and Amos and Zephaniah in this generation. Who take up the message of the prophets, which is essentially what Jesus did, and make it real and show the world who God really is and not who they think he is. And you want to be part of Grove Park. Whatever it is that God has spoken to you today, I pray that you would respond. If you're watching online, send me a note, msanders at groveparkchurch.com. But wherever it is God's spoken to you, heed his call. As we stand to sing, would you come?
I'm letting you out on time. Pack a lunch next Sunday, all right? All right. If you're, if you're visiting with us today, again, I would invite you to fill out a visitor card and place it in the rear of our sanctuary here in our offering plates. Beloved, as you go forth, go forth with the message of God to be a light in darkness, to right the wrongs that you see, to do hard things and not easy things. That in the power and grace of the Holy Spirit, you'll bring somebody back here with you next Sunday to witness the great gift of baptism and to hear that God is a God who still speaks. Would you pray with me the Grove Park prayer? Lord, Lord by your Lord Spirit, Spirit, put healing in our hands, life in our words, and drive deep within our hearts.